I've owned a lot of tools, but my first real working machines were Delta. My first good handheld power tools were Porter Cable. My first quality wrenches and other hand tools were Craftsman. Try finding these in a store today. Sure, the names still exist, but they aren't the tools your father and your grandfather used to swear by. They're among a host of iconic American tool brands that are now either gone completely or they've been bought and sold so many times they're a little more than a label on a completely different line of products. I couldn't begin to cover all of them in one video, but I thought it would be fun to take a closer look at three of them. So today, we're gonna to talk about Porter Cable, Delta, and Craftsman. We'll talk a bit about their fascinating history that's behind these products. We'll talk about what made them great and what killed them. You may think you know the whole story, but I'll bet you don't. You're really gonna enjoy the next few minutes. Porter Cable was founded in 1906 when two brothers named Porter partnered with a guy named Cable to scrape together 2,300 bucks and open a custom tooling shop in Syracuse, New York. They did it right in their garage. And between orders, they started developing their own products. First, it was a pencil sharpener, then a tire pump. Now, meanwhile, one of them looked around and said, these lathes that we're using to make stuff are pretty handy. Why don't we just sell those? So that's what they did. And that good idea led to others. And by the 20s, they were selling other types of machines, including the Syracuse Sander. In 1926, they hired the smartest guy they knew to be chief engineer. That was Arthur Emmons, and he was a genius. He may not have been named Porter or Cable, but it was Emmons who made that company because he's the guy who invented the takeabout sander. This was a revolutionary idea at the time. He took a large shop machine like a belt sander and shrunk it down to a portable size. It was huge, but the real game changer came three years later, 1929. That's when Emmons, working for Porter Cable, released a helical-driven portable circular saw. This was one of the first and definitely the most successful portable electric saws in the world. In fact, it's the same design that most of us use today 100 years later. Now at this point, they said, maybe these handheld power tools are the way to go. So they stopped making stationary machines and they focused entirely on portable ones. They made all sorts of them, but their next big innovation didn't come until 1953. That's when they introduced the first portable bandsaw. Now I'm not sure when Art Emmons retired, but he left behind a booming business. Stainless steel tools with those cool Art Deco designs were appearing everywhere, and Porter Cable was a brand that stood for quality. Then came the 60s, and Rockwell, the owner of Delta Machinery, decided to buy Porter Cable not for its name, but for its market share. So they relocated Porter Cable's operations to Tennessee. They dropped the quality because they wanted to make a line of fairly inexpensive tools to compete with what Black & Decker was at that time. And someone had the bright idea to just go ahead and kill the 60-year-old, highly respected Porter Cable name. So for 15 years, the brand was all but dead. It only existed as a PC prefix in catalog numbers. But then Rockwell figured out maybe we shouldn't be in the tool business after all, and they sold their entire operation to Pentair, which was a company that had made everything from high altitude research balloons to canoes and even paper. Now they wanted to make tools. So they bought up the operation from Rockwell, but Rockwell said, you can't have our name. Well, rather than calling it Pentair Tools, which would sound kind of dumb, they decided to resurrect the Porter Cable brand. So throughout the 80s and the 90s, Porter Cable began to rebuild its reputation. They released the first reasonably priced portable biscuit joiner in the U.S., and we all know that Norb Abram immediately built everything with that. In 1989, they released the first modern electric random orbit sander, something that most of us use in our workshops today. But their parent company, Pentair, was doing their best to screw everything up behind the scenes. After some disastrous manufacturing changes, Porter Cable was being operated at a loss in the early 2000s, and Pentair continued to acquire water treatment companies and all sorts of things that had nothing to do with tools. In 2004, they finally sold Porter Cable, Delta, and their other tool brands to Black & Decker. 
That was a little bit before Black & Decker merged with Stanley. And then a lot of Porter Cable products were outsourced overseas to factories in Mexico and China and elsewhere. Worse yet, many of their consumer woodworking tools that we all knew so well simply disappeared. Porter Cable's routers, for example, they used to be almost the industry standard. Router lifts, whatever one you buy, it would be for a Porter Cable router unless you had an adapter. They don't even make those routers anymore. Porter Cable was once one of the largest, oldest manufacturers of portable power tools in the U.S. And now they are just a smattering of tools found in a few home centers and hardware stores. And I wouldn't hold your breath waiting for a resurgence. Before we do the other two brands, I need 60 seconds to tell you about this video sponsor, but it's going to be worth it. If you're looking for something interesting to listen to, go to audible.com slash stumpynubs or just text stumpynubs to 500, 500 That's going to get you a free 30-day trial and access to Audible's massive audiobook library. I love Audible. I've been a paying member for the better part of a decade, long before they supported this channel. Since my membership gets me one free selection a month, I've got a pretty large library of great audiobooks. As you can see, I love history. Lately, I've still been working on Undaunted Courage. This is the story of the Lewis and Clark expedition told by the amazing historian Stephen Ambrose. I'm fascinated by this part of American history when explorers and traders and trappers wandered pristine wildernesses that were populated by the great tribes of the plains. This is my fourth or fifth time through this particular title. I really recommend it. Of course, Audible has selections on every subject imaginable, including their Plus catalog, which offers unlimited access to thousands of titles. They even have comedy and podcasts. Seriously, even if you're not much of a reader, give an audiobook a try. You are really going to enjoy it while you walk the dog, driving, mowing the lawn, trying to ignore someone, whatever you're into. Remember, new members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash stumpynubs or text stumpynubs to 500 500. Delta was another American success story that began in a garage. This time it was 1919 when Herbert Tout started making small scroll saws under the name Delta Specialty Company in Milwaukee. Now what may have begun, I think, as a way to find some peace and quiet away from the family turned into quite a viable business. And a few years later, he was buying bandsaws from other companies to sell under his Delta label. His big break came in 1938. That's when Delta turned the woodworking world upside down, or at least 45 degrees to the right, with the release of its first full-size 10-inch tilting arbor table saw. It was called the Unisaw, and for decades it remained one of the best saws on the market. There's a whole cult following for old Unisaws. This is what made Delta a top name in woodworking. Now, Touts didn't stick around to see the success. In 1939, he cashed out and sold the business to a group of three partners who, a couple years later, flipped it to Timken Detroit Axle Company. Now, guess who was the president of Timken Detroit Axle Company? Willard Rockwell. And before long, Delta was part of Rockwell Manufacturing Company. Now, Rockwell didn't kill Delta like they did Porter Cable. They continued to manufacture the tools in Milwaukee, well into the post-war years, but Willard made sure that the Rockwell name appeared next to the Delta brand on many of those machines. One of their biggest innovations of that period was the first power miter saw. It was originally known as the drop saw. Strangely though, for a staunch capitalist like Rockwell, he didn't patent the new saw, so other companies were soon making similar tools. This was good for consumers, but not great for Delta's business model. Some say that the quality of many Delta tools declined under Rockwell, especially as they got into the 70s. I owned a mid-70s Delta Rockwell table saw, and I thought it was decent. But by 1981, Rockler was ready to get out of the power tool business, and as we covered in the last section, they turned to Pentair to lead the brands into the 80s. Now, under Pentair's leadership, Delta once again thrived for the most part. Some of the best consumer-level woodworking machines of the 90s were made by Delta. I owned a 6-inch jointer and a 12-inch portable planer that really got me started in the craft. And I still have the jointer over here in the corner, and the planer's in the storage room. They're still running today after a lot of board feet. Everything looked great until 2004 
when Pentair sold everything to Black & Decker right before they merged with Stanley to become that massive conglomerate of brands. Now what happened next is a little murky. Despite the promising relaunch of their flagship Unisaw in 2008 under a cool updated design, it never seemed to gain much of the market. And the whole Delta brand seemed to kind of get lost among the other holdings of Stanley Black & Decker. In 2011, just seven years after acquiring it, they sold Delta to a Taiwanese company named Chang Type Industrial. They had already been manufacturing some Delta products for Stanley, but they promised by buying all of them up that they would keep what remained of the U.S. manufacturing here in the USA. And the last I heard, they were still making some products in South Carolina. But honestly, I can't remember the last time I saw Delta products on the store shelf in my area. Now this one hurts a little bit because Delta was such a big part of my early years in woodworking. In fact, as a teenager, I grew up, we had a family hardware store, and we sold Delta products in there. I really wish they would come back, but I'm not expecting it. Craftsman may be one of the most iconic of American tool brands because it sprung up from another iconic brand, the Sears Robot Company. The famous Sears catalog had been in outhouses all over the country for just 35 years when they decided in 1927 that they wanted to up their hardware game. So they spent 500 bucks to buy the name of the Marion Craftsman Tool Company. And they used part of that name, Craftsman, for a new line of hand tools. It was part of a three-tier quality system. They had Trojan brand at the bottom, they had the Fulton brand at mid-range, and if you wanted the best, you wanted Craftsman. And what sort of folks wanted the best in the late 20s and early 30s? Well, folks who drove automobiles, obviously. So Craftsman tools were chrome-plated to match the fancy accoutrements on the popular vehicles of the day, and they were made from a higher quality vanadium steel alloy. Sales immediately shot up over 500%. It wasn't all about color culture. In the mid-30s, the Craftsman brand started to appear on lawnmowers and other products. But it was mechanics tools, particularly during World War II, that made the Craftsman name, as returning GIs wanted to buy the same tools that they used during their deployment. After the war years, Sears continued to roll out more and more Craftsman products, while an 18-year-old clerk back in the shop named Peter Roberts came up with an idea that would make them a fortune. It was the quick-release ratchet. Now, Sears knew a million-dollar idea when they saw it, so they promptly gave him $10,000 for it. They turned that into hundreds of millions of dollars in sales, and they cheated poor Pete out of promised royalties until decades later when they had to fork over $8 million to settle a lawsuit. That wouldn't be the last time Sears got caught ripping someone off. Meanwhile, the Craftsman name was so popular that Bob Vila, who in the 80s was known as the Hasselhoff of PBS, said, see ya suckers, to the folks at this old house, and he started shilling Craftsman products full time. Anyone who owned a television set in the 90s quickly learned that Bob loved him some Craftsman tools. Of course, Craftsman was not a manufacturer. They were just a brand. A host of other American companies made the tools that received the Craftsman label. That meant that many Craftsman products, particularly their lawn care line and some of their shop machines, were virtually identical to competing products except for the labeling. However, Craftsman tools often came with fantastic warranties. No questions asked, no receipt required. If it broke, you took it to the nearest Sears and they replaced it with a smile, sometimes on the spot. That warranty was pure genius. It turned Craftsman into a truly iconic brand. But all that eventually started to unravel. Throughout the 80s, Sears had been diversifying into all sorts of non-retail spaces. Banking, credit cards, they partnered with IBM, they even got into shopping mall construction. They took their eye off the ball, and Walmart came up, stole the ball, and dunked on them. After losing their spot as the nation's top retailer, Craftsman and Sears sales declined. Sears got sued for all sorts of shenanigans. Their automotive repair business was criminally charged for cheating their customers. They moved out of the fancy digs at the Sears Tower. And what was left of Sears merged with Kmart in 2004. That's right, Kmart, with its bologna subs and its blue light specials. If you get the bologna subs reference, then you're as old as me. Craftsman tools on Kmart shelves didn't help the brand's image. 
Neither did the whittling away of the famous no-hassle warranty, which they started applying to fewer and fewer products. Many Craftsman products were dropped altogether. Customers couldn't get service. They couldn't get replacements. They were refused refunds. Kmart stores smelled bad. It was just a huge mess. Craftsman's following was further eroded as it discovered that despite the Made in the USA labels on everything, many Craftsman products were now in fact being made outside of the United States. So that led to more lawsuits and over $10 billion in losses later, Craftsman was sold to Stanley Black & Decker in 2017 because apparently that's who buys every brand these days. SBD has pledged to return Craftsman to its former glory, including moving some manufacturing back to the United States. And while they do make some Craftsman products here in the U.S., many are still made overseas five years later. This includes most of their mechanics tools, which was once the backbone of the brand's image. Nowadays, Craftsman tools can be found at various retailers, particularly at Lowe's, but it's a shadow of the great brand it once was. I hope this one comes back. It seems like they're trying. I guess we'll see what happens. So we're sensing a theme here. Entrepreneurs with great ideas start businesses in their garages that grow to become iconic brands with great products. Then someone else tries to buy that success but they didn't build it themselves, so they don't realize that customers are loyal to the great products, not just the name. And if they cut the quality of those products and just try to live off the brand's past reputation, they eventually end up with just a name that nobody believes in anymore. If you've enjoyed this video, leave a comment below to tell me which brands you'd like to learn about next time. See you then.